Hello and welcome to another edition of the Moving Iron Podcast. This podcast is proudly provided by Axon, helping dealers move more iron for almost 100 years. Find out more at axontire.com. Axon was started almost 100 years ago out of a passion for keeping agriculture moving. It's that same passion that drives them today. With a vision for a better experience for both farmer and dealer, they set out to create a better way to move more iron. When you partner with Axon, you get immediate access to a full range of products and solutions designed to meet the complex needs of today's grower. Axon carries all major brands and sizes of tires, wheels, and tracks. From custom colors and sizes to fully customized wheels, you can have the solution for virtually any problem today's farmer is trying to solve. To find more or become an Axon dealer, please visit axontire.com. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Time and time again Through the years you'll find us here Moving Iron Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast. Marcus with Chip Nellinger. This edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by Axon Tire, helping dealers move more iron for the past 100 years. For more information, go to axontire.com. Also, if you're looking for a great place to find good ways to manage your salespeople's activity as well as help them manage their deals better, check out Arrow at HeyArrow.com. Chip is with Blue Reef Agri-Marketing out of Morton, Illinois, and Chip is nice enough to come on once a week to talk about what's going on in the marketplace. So, Chip, how you been, man? Hey, doing well, Casey. Thanks for having me on. It's been, uh, as always, an interesting time in the markets here to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, to this has been a uh, this week in particular has been a very volatile week in the markets. A lot of stuff has has been taken off and, and climbing up. Um, let's start with wheat for a little bit. Wheat has been kind of leading the way here a little bit for the most part of this month uh, and last month for that matter. And, and as you take a look at the wheat market, what's going on there? Um, you kind of feel like we've hit that high for the year, and maybe we're, we're starting to maybe regress a little bit, and then. Maybe see something here as we head into that January report. Yeah, you know, I, wheat, as you mentioned, it has been leading us higher. And uh, you don't oftentimes uh, get to say that. Uh, you know, a lot of times in years past, they're like, man, this corn market can rally, except wheat is just a dog. So it's been the exact opposite where wheat has kind of led us higher. Obviously, some well-publicized problems with the spring wheat crop in the northern plains. Right. and You know, uh, some, some European Black Sea uh, area shortfalls in wheat. Uh, to me, I, I, it feels to me like we're getting a little overextended in here. Uh, you know, we're north of $8. Spring wheat has put a correction in. It, uh, you know, quietly is now, uh, I don't know, 60, 70 cents uh, off its highs. And it got into an area between 10 and $11 that on a long-term continuation chart makes some sense why the spring wheat, uh, you know, would, would slow down. Here, here's the thing about wheat, <clears throat> you know, we talk to producers in uh, in areas southern illinois southern indiana uh they do raise some wheat down there but there's guys that planted wheat uh, this fall that haven't planted wheat in you know 10 or 15 years so high prices will do its job and bring in production not only here but across the world um you know we're coming into the uh time frame where we're going to have a southern hemisphere uh, harvest coming up uh and and so you know, I'm not here to say that there's no upside in, in wheat left, but this thing is uh, getting to be a mature bull. You've got, you know, well over eight dollars for, um, you know, this uh, 2021. You're looking at, uh, you know, July of 22 that also is offering prices over eight dollars. Twenty three wheat uh, got uh, somewhere in the seven seventy, almost seven eighty range. Wow. And yeah. so I think we're doing. Uh, a job with price that's bringing some uh, production in, and, and that's the function of the market, right? If you right. just let it do its thing and not interfere with it, high prices will bring in, you know, those marginal acres and extra production. We took them out with low prices. We're seeing the result of that now with high prices, and you know, the backside of that pendulum is going to be a uh, greater planted uh, acreage, I-, I believe, across the world here over the next uh, six to nine months as well. Right on. So when you look at, you kind of talked about the Black Sea and those kind of, in that area in Europe and what they've got going on there. There's a lot of, obviously a lot of pressure over there with the Ukrainian-Russia situation, but there's also a lot of pipelines that come through there that, through Ukraine that feed feed into Europe. Um, 
Europe's uh, wheat situation has uh, over the last couple of years have been pretty pretty tight. So has Russia's wheat. So has Ukrainian wheat. I mean, all, that whole area has just has been has has been a tight situation. What kind of play do you think that's going to have on the overall market here as we start getting those final numbers start pouring in here um, as we head that towards the end of the year? Yeah, you know, there's always a, a lot of moving gears with that. Uh, one thing that's a little confusing here is it, it does seem like over the past couple of weeks that uh, Ukraine maybe has maybe a touch more corn than what they initially thought. They've been selling some corn uh, allegedly to China in here. That's probably business uh, we would have gotten. And so maybe that Ukrainian corn crop uh, is, is a touch better. Uh, Russian, uh, the wheat situation you know, part of this is uh, a, uh, you know, hangover, so to speak, from uh, COVID and the shutdowns and everything from uh, a year and a half ago. Um, not so sure that Russia doesn't have the crop, but they're trying to battle internal wheat price rises, right? Uh, mm -hmm. their, their internal wheat has gone up. Uh, I believe it's close to record highs, if, if not record high. That is not something their government wants is, um, you know, they're, uh, ordinary citizen in Russia to be uh, crunched because wheat's a massive part uh, of their diet and their uh, culture there. And so, you know, that that's the situation. It's not maybe necessarily that it's that short of a, of a crop. It's just that there's kind of that hoarding aspect where countries with the supply chain issues and the shortages from uh, leftover from COVID, they do not want to run out of food. And uh, so they're kind of in uh, a little bit of horde mode. Now, with all that being said, Putin has the power. You mentioned the energy situation a little bit. You, you know, I think uh, uh, some of our quote unquote, um, I don't know, for lack of a better term, enemies, uh, uh, Russia, China, uh, due to, you know, our own issues here uh, in starting with the uh, Afghanistan debacle, uh, probably are going to push the envelope a little bit. And so Putin has all the power from the natural gas standpoint. Europe wants the gas. Uh, he's got the gas. And he's uh, got the power now because you're about to, you know, run head steam into the brick wall of winter over there. And, and so with that, you know, there's been some, uh, you know, uh, upheaval with the uh, Ukraine-Russia situation. And, you know, they're going to test us. And uh, they probably not going to run into much resistance, uh, and, and they're going to take back maybe some uh, lost ground, so to speak, both Russia and China is. Uh, you know, we had some talks with um, uh, the uh, Chinese president and, and Biden earlier this week. Didn't really have supposedly much to do with uh, with trade, uh, which is probably good from China's standpoint, because they're going to continue to, you know, do what they've always done. <laughs> and that right. is exactly. buy it from anyone uh, yeah. that uh, isn't United States unless they absolutely need it. And so, you know, that's a long answer to your question, Casey, but, you know, I, I think this wheat situation may be in the early stages of trying to resolve itself a little bit uh, with increased production. But, uh, you know, Europe and the energy situation over there certainly plays into the ge geopolitical part of this. And yeah, it's just a lot of a lot of moving parts here to this thing. Yep. I mean, to that point, they just had a, I don't know, some like an Asian trade meeting of sorts and everybody was there but china you know you had i think it was like india south korea japan um you know so it's it's kind of showing that we're, we're doing our best not to include them in in what's going on and that's right right wrong or indifferent uh that is something that we, strategically we need to kind of have that that arm's length with them i think sometimes but all right, so as you take a look oh, at... Don't, don't even get me started, Casey. <laughs> <laughs> don't even get me started. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a mess. But anyway, yeah, I, I could go for days, too, on that topic as well. But um, All right, jump down to South America real quick. Take a look at what's going on there. There is a lot of activity that you see down there. I mean, every report that's coming out of there is it's going to be the best crop ever, which isn't... I've never seen anyone, after planting a crop, come in and say we're going to have the worst crop ever. But that being said... There were a lot of acres that got planted uh, in South America. So as you take a look, what's going on down there? Um, they've got the, you got some rains and those kind of things to, uh, during the uh, planting of that that soybean crop. So I guess you take a look at what's going on there, and uh, you know going through a Serfina and, and what you see happening with that corn crop there. I mean, what are your thoughts as you look at South America right now? Yeah, I, I think this is a great 
learning example here. Uh, I don't disagree with anything you said about South America. Uh, it appears that they are on track right now, uh, unless a, a, a very quick problem develops within the next, uh, say, five or six weeks here, it appears that they are on track for uh, what potentially could be a massive, massive crop. Biggest ever by a long shot. Not like, hey, we barely beat the old record. I'm talking about, you know, the potential to be, you know, three, four hundred million bushels um, higher than the or more uh, above their previous highest bean crop ever. And so uh, but the learning part of this is all that's fine. Nothing's changed there. In fact, it's gotten better, uh, in my opinion, because they have got uh, some rains in parts of southern Brazil. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better start <clears throat> to their planting and early growing season. But uh, here we are, you know, uh, one, two, three, four, six days after the uh, crop report. Remember, we broke 75 cents into the crop report because, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to be swimming in beans and uh, uh, Brazil has this massive crop coming. And the low of the report day was 1181 and a quarter in January beans. We're now... Um, you know, trading at uh, 11.62, so you you know you're talking uh, 80 cents uh, above where we were trading on the report day on the November report day, and arguably things have gotten better in Brazil. So it just goes to show you, you know, the fundamental picture uh, isn't uh, always the the main thing here, and the market's going to do what it's going to do. Uh, we got people too short going into the report. You got soy meal too cheap relative to soy oil and corn. Uh, you've had a huge rally straight up in soy meal. Uh, that's only increased the profitability to domestic crushers here. You know, soy oil's 44 plus percent of the crush. So as soy oil has rallied, they're actually increasing the profitability, whereas soy oil is only 11 percent of the total crush. And so this has helped, um, you know, increase domestic uh, crush margins, and it's more of a technical trade. You're towards the top end of the range now. Everybody that was all bared up, thinking we're going to, you know, back to nine dollar beans immediately, and now blown out of the market. They just uh, uh, had their head blown off, and they're uh, scratching their head, wondering, uh, "Hey, that was really fun being short beans. We just rallied eighty cents, uh, and nothing was bullish." And, and so it just goes to show you, you have to have a plan, right? Mm -hmm. And a plan, uh, the fundamentals. Win in the end, but in the short run, there's a lot of fluctuations, and this has largely been spread-related, technical-related. You're now to the upper end of the range. Uh, you know, if you sold this thing uh, ahead of the report day and threw in the towel, you're really kicking yourself right now. And But if you didn't, now is an opportunity. And, and I'm not saying you can't go higher. You're up at the very uh, upper end of some resistance in here. If you can close these January beans above... 1266 and a quarter. Uh, you know, I think you got a shot of, of pushing maybe just shy of $13, but this is an opportunity. We know where our bean yields were. Uh, in most cases, they were very, very strong. You got massive gross dollar uh, per acre figure staring you at the face now, uh, both corn and beans. And you've got new crop beans at 1250 and a half right now on the November 22. And, uh, you know, that's one of the highest levels we've ever been able to start. Uh, when you start talking about risk management for, uh, you know, this far out, a year out, and beans for that 22 crop. So, to me, there's a yellow flag here waving in the air and uh, lights shining in our face screaming, you know, opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. we got to uh, look at the gross dollars, and we got to start thinking very seriously about some, uh, you know, 22 bean uh, risk management uh, strategies because it's a profitable level right now. And corn, with the input costs, um, you know, aren't as strong a prospects right now relative to where beans are from a new crop position. Right on. All right, let's talk about the, uh, the proteins here a little bit. So if you look at what's going on over in hogs, you know, China's still coming and buying stuff. You're still seeing that. But, I mean, cutouts got just tore up yesterday. So, I mean, I guess it's, as you look at um, what's going on there, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that as far as, you know, China keeps coming and buying stuff, you know, do what I say, not what I do type of, you know, listen, listen to what I, watch what I do, not what I say type of thing with China. And as you take a look at that, I mean, what are, what are your thoughts there? 
as you look at that at that hog market? Yeah, I mean that's been a volatile market um, to try to predict. We had you know double digit gains yesterday. You know right. February hogs are up a couple bucks, and as you mentioned, afternoon cutout just decimated. So one of the worst jobs in the world right now, in my opinion, to be a you know a, a cash meat trader, particularly on the pork side of the equation. I don't know how you'd even keep your sanity uh, trying to do that. Uh, the other thing that's a little concerning to me, and and I, you know, I just saw some blips on it. Is you know the potential that the Biden administration is saying, "Oh, we're going to try to help this inflation by increasing the chain speed on the pork side." And I'm like, you know, <laughs> do you really want them doing that? Right now, uh, can we even do that? You, you know, know yeah. I, I don't even know that's even possible. If it was at, possible, at, we'd at already point. do it, right? I mean, it would be. Yeah. You know what I mean? Last thing in the world you want is them screwing that up. Yeah. And so, to me, that is a, a little bit of a warning flag. Uh, I think yesterday's strength was uh, a little bit out of the ordinary, um, out of the blue for me and a head scratcher. But we're still in this, you know, huge inflationary environment where different days, you know, there's there's various markets that there's just money that comes in. You know, people right. just want to own stuff. Yep. Uh, I mean, you look at some of these, uh, you know, gold's had a run, but not every day. Uh, you know, pork, uh, hogs, I guess, in the big picture, maybe with the setback we've seen off the high here over the last couple months, people th- feel that's cheap. Uh, coffee's been on a huge run. Yep. Uh, you know, obviously we talked about wheat, uh, you know, up at multi-year highs. So I don't know. Uh, a little bit concerning to me. Uh, but, you know, here's the other thing. From a producer standpoint, even with the rally in meal, and even with, you know, five and a half dollar corn out there, you look at some of these deferred hogs, summer hogs, the August hogs, 95.10, July of 22, 96 and a quarter. I mean, these are great levels, just great levels. And, and so, you know, we can argue fundamentals and increase the chain speed and China buying pork. But I think at the, at the end of the day, you got to look out there and say, you know, this thing looks pretty darn good from a pro- profitability standpoint, even out a year. So I think from a producer standpoint, you got to be looking at revenue and margins and uh, maybe not trying to predict as much because that's going to be impossible. Right. Absolutely. I right, jump over and talk about what's going on over on the cattle complex. Um, seems like there's a little bit of a wait and see thing there. Um, cash prices are... You know, there's been some light activity here this week, but as you look at what's going on, I guess cattle cattle on feed report comes out here on Friday, right? And then that'll give you give a chance to see what what's actually out there. So I guess what's your thoughts there? Yeah, but, you know, a little bit different than the hog side of the equation. Uh, we've seen the cash market finally uh, start performing here the last three or four weeks, and we really narrowed the basis, meaning cash now is you know, about equivalent to where the December futures are. And uh, the problem here is the deferreds, February, you know, call it five plus dollars above where the cash market currently is. And the April is, uh, you know, eight to nine dollars above where the cash market is. We've got a lot of optimism built in out there into the winter. And so, you know, I don't, I think we're maybe towards the upper end of what fair value is for the time being. I think there's a lot of people with, you know, based on all kinds of things, demand, uh, the drought, and, uh, you know, the, the amount of cows we're killing is, you know, 10, 12-year highs. That's been a little bit of a drag on the front end, but I think in the back end of that, people are saying, this thing's going to get really good. Our numbers are going to shrink. Uh, my fear is it's not going to happen fast enough for some of the bulls, uh, meaning a lot of people thought it would be February, April. I think it could be out in the summer where things get really, really good, which isn't kind of the normal. Um, and so, you know, again, from a producer standpoint, you know, you knock on the door at 140 uh, April, and, uh, you know, we've been up uh, towards 138 on the Februarys. That's got to be looked at pretty closely because that's good money. Um, you know, if you want to be bullish, do, you know, buy a put or some sort of put strategy and, and keep some upside there. But these are good levels on the February and April. 
Uh, I think that that's not to say that we can't get really good uh, somewhere out ahead of us, but you know, to, to think the cash market can go $20 higher by February might be a little bit of a stretch. We already got you know, six, seven dollars of that uh, factored in already. So got a little bit of a head start on the futures out there with the premium that they've got right now. Right on. Well, Chip, good stuff as usual. Folks, want to reach out to you and get more information about what you're doing over there at Blue Roof Agri Marketing. What's the best way to do that? Best way, just give us a call at the office, 309-550-7213. We'd love to, love to chat with you. It's, uh, I tell you what, Case, I've been doing this a long time. I love the markets. I love the, you know, kind of the four-dimensional chess uh, game aspect of it and it is uh, more challenging than ever and 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 that's fun to us but from a producer standpoint it, it drives them crazy but uh, that's what we uh, love and enjoy so we'd love to chat with you right on well chip thanks for being on the podcast man you bet thanks for having me on i am casey seymour with moving iron podcast make sure you check me out on facebook twitter and instagram that's where you're going to find the latest editions of the moving iron podcast also go to movingironllc.com for everything moving iron related so with that i am casey seymour with chip nellinger let's go move some iron folks out you want to have a meaningful competitive advantage to help sell more equipment whether you represent the sales, parts, or management department of an implement dealership, there's a surprising amount of complexity when it comes to tire, wheel, and track technology. Let Axon worry about that so you can get back to supporting your customers. Axon has leveraged years of experience to create a streamlined process that gives you a proven path to help today's grower and sell more equipment. The roots of their organization go back almost 100 years to the invention of the rubber tractor tire. Supporting agriculture is the number one driver of Axon from product development through sales and service. To find more or become an Axon dealer, head over to axontire.com. Moving higher in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving higher time and time again. Through the years you'll find us here